Hello? Hey, everybody, and welcome. Excuse me. Woo. Gentlemen, do you know what time it is? It's time. Time for what? Something big. Something so big. <laughs> Were you scared? Tell me honestly. Do you want to know what it is at the movies? What? At the movies. What's that? Very good movies. Movies? I haven't been to the movies in ages. Mm-mm. This is for church. At the movies. Church. Movies. The church. The movie. The church meeting. Movies. Inconceivable. We're a match made in heaven. Let's all go to the movies. Good morning. Thank you for joining us as we're finishing off uh, the series at the movies. Uh, I know Pastor Derek said it. It was in the trailer. But if you didn't know, we're going to go through the movie Unbroken today. Now, if you guys have ever heard me uh, uh, talk before, uh, you'll know that I say there is a Simpsons episode for anything you're going to talk about. So you won't believe how hard it was not to pick the Simpsons movie. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some lessons in there. They're not, uh, not good or biblical usually, but they're, they're there, right? <laughs> so you can figure something out. Anyway, Shelby told me no, so we're here. We're here. <laughs> now... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was loving uh, this time around doing at the movies for the amount of true stories that we've been uh, been running through, and uh, why wouldn't we, right? They're they're being told for a reason, and it's it's just so cool to see the experiences that some people have gone, either just in life or their experiences with God. And I love that we're able to 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 incorporate that into what we what we do here. Uh, but before I get any further, uh, we do have a tradition that we usually do with at the movies. And that we, uh, we have a copy of it with something else. Uh, so whoever has not seen this movie, could you please raise your hand? That's really good to see because I can say whatever I want now about the movie. <laughs> okay. It was in the trailer just as a hint. But first person of who has not seen the movie, if you can tell me who directed this movie. Okay, if you have not seen this movie before, I highly recommend uh, uh, taking a watch after, uh, after we're done here today. Now, part of the reason why we do this series at the movies uh, is because Jesus was a storyteller. He would use stories, he would use parables to teach us biblical principles, to teach us lessons, and that we could learn. So we want to use uh, our culture, use things that are relevant to us and the, the people around us to try and try and get these lessons lessons through too. Uh, the bonus of this as well is that they have a much bigger budget than anything I can film in my garage. So that's why we use their stories, not mine, right? <laughs> okay, so Unbroken. Uh, I'll actually start now. <laughs> uh, Unbroken is a movie about uh, a man named Louis Zamperini. And uh, it just runs through uh, uh, a crazy, crazy life that, uh, that he lived. Um, so just give you a really quick background of who he was. Um, what we see from him as a little child is that he was the biggest uh, brat you'll ever meet, that he was, uh, he was drinking and smoking at age 10 and uh, would be caught stealing, was frequently brought home to, uh, uh, to his parents by the police to the point that every police officer knew he w who he was and he, they knew who his parents were. <clears throat> uh, one thing that I will say uh, Louis had um, going for him is actually his brother. <laughs> Uh, in his early ages, he had an older brother named Pete, and it's actually thanks to Pete uh, that we have a story here at all to go through. So I'm going to have the first clip thrown up there just to, to see the impact that, that he had on his life, if you want to watch this. You can see there's that, uh, that sibling bond between them, 
and uh, Pete knew that his brother was a handful. Uh, he knew that he was getting in trouble all the time, and uh, it's actually sad to see, but you can, you can see so many interviews from uh, Louis himself and say that part of the uh, issue for him growing up is, uh, although they were born and uh, raised in the U.S., uh, there was an Italian uh, immigrated family, and that's all he spoke as a, as a, in his early years. So it just kind of separated him from, from kids, and sometimes uh, it's hard to, hard to get back. So sometimes you need someone to pull you, and that for Louis, that, that person was Pete. Uh, Pete was the one that kind of pulled him back into reality and, and just gave him that hard lesson early on that if you go the way you're going, that, that you're going to be a bum, you know, or, or you can, you can, you can uh, push, you can keep pushing to become stronger. And <coughs> uh, he also gives us probably the most important line in this film of if you can take it, you can make it. Louis would go on to base his entire life on that phrase. Because uh, what we get to, uh, uh, to watch is that no matter what's thrown at him, uh, what he's going to walk through or, or how strong his opponent is, he will push to be stronger. That he's never going to stay on the ground and that he'll continue to strive to be better. And what we watch is uh, there's a montage uh, just after this of his, uh, his running career of him uh, setting records uh, through junior or through grade school, through high school, um, and not just records for his school or city or state, but nationwide in the U.S., he set records for track as a teenager. And, and then we get to watch him. He, he goes to the Olympics as a teenager to, to run and represent his country in uh, the 1930s there. Even there, uh, even there, when he's at the Olympics, he sets a lap record. So although he didn't win anything, he still pushed to leave his mark. It's something that was so impressive. The, the host of the Olympics asked to meet him afterwards, after the race. He continued to push, to strive, to, to be better, and to, to never let that phrase leave his mind. If you can take it, you can make it. Uh, afterwards, uh, like I said, it's in the 1930s. Uh, Louis then joined uh, the uh, military uh, for World War II. He joined the Air Force. His brother joined the Navy, and he was in the Air Force. And I think it's really cool. Uh, you get to watch or you hear his stories um, about his time there. And what he did a lot of is actually rec rescue ops. So they would be informed that a plane had gone down, people had gone missing, and they would go out to search for them. The movie starts out on one of these missions. And then uh, we see these flashbacks, and then it goes into another mission where, uh, unfortunately, their plane breaks down. They crash into the ocean. And uh, they're forced to try and survive, survive with just the two life rafts. So we see the plane go down. Uh, of 11 soldiers that were on the plane, three of them survived it. And they would go on to try and survive on these two life rafts for, uh, for quite some time. <coughs> uh, now, unfortunately for them, uh, <laughs> the plane crash was probably the first of their, uh, their concerns as they're going to survive on these, uh, these rafts. So in the next clip that we're going to see, we're going to see one of the uh, one of the real hardships that they had to uh, to face regularly while uh, on the raft. If you want to play the next clip here. So the image there is just uh, the three of them on the, the raft there. Uh, storms were just one of the things that they would have to face uh, over their time on the raft. Uh, the list is actually unreal. Quite honestly, if you watch this movie, almost half the movie is their time on the raft because it was just, there's so much to unpack. But I feel like this scene here really sums up uh, their experience there. Although that they didn't have to deal with the weather all the time, every day was them clinging to life with every ounce of strength. Not to fall off the raft, not to give in to hunger. The sun, can you imagine being in the ocean for for one day? You know, during the whole day you have the sun on you, you're getting roasted, and then at night trying not to die from the cold. So throw that on top of the things like hunger. I can't even blame one of the guys. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the three that survived on there. In the first day, the, the pack that comes with the life raft of food and water, he ate all of it. He hid it from the other two, ate all of it, and then uh, said it didn't matter because who's going to find them, right? So it shows that there was so little hope of, uh, of trying to survive on this raft. And, and the, like I said, the sun, the nighttime cold, the, the hunger, 
the the sharks. They were being circled by sharks constantly. You had to be careful not to leave your arm or your leg hanging off the side of the boat because they jumped up and would uh, attack the raft every once in a while. And then planes, even planes. You think you're in the middle of the ocean, what is the thing you don't have to worry about is a plane, but that's not the case for them. <laughs> uh, out on the uh, the raft, they have their their flare gun. They've got all the supplies to try and get the attentions of any passing planes. And they did once. Of all the planes that went over, they got the attention of it once, and it happened to be a Japanese aircraft. So it turned around and started firing on the two rafts that they were in. So it leaves them with a choice. Do you stay on the raft and hope you don't get hit, or do you jump into the water and and uh, hope, that <laughs> hope that you don't get uh, attacked by a shark while you're in there? It's just an unreal story uh, of, of the, the hardships that they had to walk through, or not walk through, float through, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's an incredible story, and what it leads to them is uh, you get to watch Louis, uh, that attitude, if you can take it, you can make it. And he refuses to yield. Uh, through all the hunger, he would try fishing, they would catch birds and then use the birds to try and catch fish. And it even led to him, he jumped off the raft to grab a shark and pull it onto the raft. And they used the shark for food. This is unreal. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we get to watch as Louis pushes, continues, uh, and, and thrives in this situation where the other two have really given up hope. He's telling them stories from back home to keep them, their minds engaged, keep them focused. And he would tr pretend to make them breakfast and meals. Uh, through the day as well, to just try and keep their minds still engaged in their situation. And we watch watch Louis and, uh, and them survive for 47 days on this raft until they were, till they were rescued. And I use the air quotes to say rescued because uh, they were picked up by a Japanese ship. So then they were taken off the raft and rescued from there, but thrown into a prisoner of war camp as a, as a result of it. Just un unreal, unreal stories that these... Uh, these gentlemen had to face, and that's why, why so much of this movie takes place in that, and there's so much to unpack, so I apologize for, for going through every, trying to go through every little detail. It's just, it's mind-blowing when you watch, watch the movie or hear, uh, hear Louis talk about the experience. <clears throat> so after the raft, they go to prisoner of war camp, and here uh, they're treated as expected. You know, they're starved, beaten, everything in between. Uh, to try and break their spirits. But we watch Louis uh, refuse, refuse to yield. You even saw in the trailer there where the guard hits him with the rifle and he gets back up and stares right in his face again. It was a man who just refused to yield because if you can take it, you can make it. And that's how he lived. Uh, there was a good part and bad part for him as well in the prison camp of uh, being a uh, famous athlete. Uh, the bad part was that they would make him race other prisoners or guards, and if he lost, then they would beat him. They would punish him for losing. But every time they made him do it, he would continue to race until he finished, whether he had lost already or not. If he fell, he would get back up and continue to do it. The good side is he was actually uh, taken by uh, the Japanese government to Tokyo and given an opportunity uh, as uh, someone who was well-known in the States to, to relay a message over the radio. Uh, to his family, to his friends, to say that he's alive, that he's, he's okay, or as best as he can be, being a prisoner of war. But just, could you imagine as a family, thinking your, your child or your, your brother is, is, is gone, he's dead, right? That he was lost at sea, and then to all of a sudden hear his, his voice over the radio from overseas. It's just incredible, incredible experiences that, that this man went, went through. Uh, the next clip that we're going to throw up is uh, just immediately after he was given this opportunity to uh, to speak uh, speak over the radio. So if you guys want, just throw the next clip up, and we'll we'll take a look here. If you can take it, you can make it. Is how he lived his life. I want to break out the the first part of the the scene where he's at the restaurant there, just just to clarify what was going on. So Louis was given the opportunity to speak that radio broadcast to his family, to his friends, uh, to let them know that he was alive and, and, and still here. Uh, afterwards, when he's at the restaurant, the two men sit down and, and hand him a sheet full of propaganda that's anti-American, uh, pro-Japan, pro pro-Germany. Uh, so this uh, sheet he was given, he said he can't read it. He knew it was wrong. He knew it would it'd label him as a traitor for his country. 
So the men tried to show the other guys who were in the back there, the three that were sitting at the other table that they zoomed in on. Those were three American soldiers as well who had agreed to, to this deal. Now, for a lot of people, I'm like, why wouldn't you take the easy way out? He was given an opportunity that if he was to read this propaganda, he could uh, have money, have home, be able to live freely in Tokyo and not have to be a prisoner anymore. Not a, a, a prisoner. He wouldn't have to be in the, in the prison camp anymore. But Louis chose to go back to the prison. Why? Uh, this moment in the film, uh, there's one, one thing that popped out to both Shelby and I as we were watching through. is actually the story of David. Um, if you think about Louis early on, he was just kind of a regular kid, given a great opportunity going to the Olympics. And then we watch a spiral of events of his life spiraling downwards. Um, so there's, scene, there's a, a passage I want to read from 1 Samuel uh, 24. Uh, it's verses 1 to 7 if you want to follow along with me, or it should be up on the screen there for you as well. Uh, so verse 1 to 7, uh, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the, the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way. There was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do with him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his uh, men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my king, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So this scene of, of Louis just made me think of, of David, David's choice here. Both of them were given an option. Uh, for David, his two options. On one hand, he could have listened to his men. They could have attacked and uh, defeated Saul right then and there. I mean, he was close enough that he could cut off a piece of his cloak. But what would that, what would that do if David were to, do, to take action here? Uh, David knew that uh, the consequence of this, is, of this could be quite severe. That uh, he would have been taking a kingdom by force. He would have been a murderer. Instead of being a great king that he was uh, and raised the kingdom of Israel, he would have been viewed as, as a kingslayer, a traitor. And you think about the history books and Israel and his rule, would it even be remembered if that was the case? So there's consequences of every action that we take. And David was smart enough to know that an easy choice, the easy option, is not always the right option. So we watch Louis here, and we see him go through that same thought process that he knows if he were to read the propaganda, his life would be so much easier right now. But in the long term, who knows what it's going to look like if Japan won or USA won in the war, what, what's going to happen to him afterwards? He'd be viewed out as a traitor in his own country. So the other option, go back to prison, presumably be punished and possibly executed for, for defying the, the Japanese government. And obviously what we just watched is a little intense. Uh, it's a really long scene too, so I cut it down a little bit. Um, but the prison guard had him stand in front, had every soldier hit him uh, as a punishment for, for disobeying the government. But if you can take it, you can make it. As David knew he could endure, Louis know he knew he could endure uh, what, was, what was coming to him. <coughs> The next scene that we're going to throw up there is uh, the final, I, I'll call it a standoff that Louis has with this particular prison guard. Uh, see, Louis was taken uh, to a prison, and then there was this gentleman that they called the bird. He was the warden there, and he absolutely tortured Louis the entire time he was there. And then it actually, eventually that warden got moved to another camp. So then when Louis refused to read this propaganda, they sent him to the bird's new camp as well so that they were just punishing him even further that way to someone who tormented him. So the last scene that we're going to throw up here, 
uh, from Unbroken is uh, just this final moment, final confrontation that the two of them have. If you want to just throw it up, we'll watch this together. So very quickly, uh, what was going on there is uh, they're working uh, unloading coal off a ship and Louis was taking a break. So the prison guard brought him over, gave him that, uh, that piece of lumber, and the second he dropped it from holding it over his head, the guards were ordered to shoot him. And there's two thoughts that come to mind for me every time I watch this scene. One is that I think I'd get shot. I can't, <laughs> I can't, uh, can't lift the arm up, so <laughs> I don't think I'd make it through that one. And I, I love scenes like this. Um, you can see so much effort from the director, the actors, to make this scene really intense for you to feel the energy and the emotion there. And then there's that guy that's like <coughs> laughing in the corner and I just, it takes me out of it every time I watch that, that scene. But what we watch here is Louis just being outright defiant of this prison guard, refusing to be broken, even under the threat of death the man refused to be broken. And I love the little shots of uh, where it switches to him running, that he's not, he's not finished. Louis's not finished. Even though he's on the ground, he's being, being uh, uh, punished for, for defying this prison guard. He's not done. Because in Louis's mind, if you can take it, you can make it. And that's what this movie shows us, right? That under our strength, we can do anything. And that's the message this movie tries to get across. And as I'm walking through, I'm like, it just doesn't feel quite right. It doesn't feel quite right. And I'm like, there's something missing. So what I loved is, um, uh, as this movie ends, uh, Louis, uh, if you know how World War II ends, uh, prisoners are freed, they go home. Uh, so he's allowed to go home, and the movie ends as he's greeting his family. Uh, I didn't know this until I started actually researching this movie, but there's actually a second one that they did uh, called uh, Unbroken Path to Redemption. And this is about Louis's life afterwards, a man who is uh, pushed so hard to, uh, to live as if you can take it, you can make it, that under his own strength, he would not be beaten. He was not going to be, uh, he was not going to stay on the ground. Uh, in the second film, uh, it's actually done by Pure Flix, so it's a different actor, different director, as uh, a couple of scenes are going to get thrown up there, uh, just so you guys are aware. But what we watch is... Uh, the aftermath of coming home from, from war, from this prison. And we watch uh, as Louis uh, tries to get back into a normal life where uh, he has nightmares every night of the wrath of the prison, of this guard tormenting him. And he begins to, to cope, uh, cope with alcohol. So he gets drunk so he doesn't remember but can't sleep because of the nightmares. So... Uh, as he comes home, the military uh, grabs him, the U.S. government grabs him, and he starts doing uh, tours around to talk about his experience being uh, uh, left at sea, uh, the prison camp, and, and then returning home. Because uh, he's viewed as, as a hero by his, uh, his uh, family, his community, and the country as a whole. So he does these tours uh, uh, to help recoup costs from, from, from the war. Uh, but his... Uh, depression and addiction gets so bad that even his supervisor just tells him like you need a breather so they send him away to take a paid leave uh to to recover to rest and recover uh while he's here it's actually really cool you get to see uh him uh meet his wife or who would be his wife and uh them get married and you see louis start to pull out of this pull out of this funk um but you know after the war it was hard for them to uh to find work hard them for them to find uh, for anything to do, uh, especially with the trauma that they faced. So Louis was uh, starting to sink back down into a bit of a depression where <clears throat> he couldn't find work, couldn't find uh, a way to support his family. The only, uh, the only money that he had was actually from being declared dead <laughs> uh, by the U.S. government that they had given them a lump sum of money. Uh, as he seems like he has no more options, he decides that he's going to train to go to the next Olympics. So as an overage athlete, uh, it's his last ditch effort to try and try and show that he's still strong. He still has strength. Um, and it's actually quite cool to watch. He's actually well on his way to, uh, to the Olympics. He has, uh, he's able to run the qualifying time to make it. Uh, and then when he uh, has a bet with his family, he uh, decides to run around a track 
And then uh, if you want to throw on the next clip here, uh, this is the aftermath of uh, him doing one more run here. So like I said, different actor. If uh, so that was Louis. <laughs> Um, one thing that really sticks out, there's, this is a really important scene uh, for both the films uh, in Louis's life. I, I know we lean so heavy into his story because there's so much to unpack and so much that he experienced, but this is quite a tipping point for him. Uh, if you recall when I said uh, there was the one gentleman on the raft who ate all the food, drank their water, and his response was, it doesn't matter because he had no hope. It had been broken, and that's what we just watched with Louis there. Why didn't he talk about the injury before? Because it didn't matter. That's it. It's over. And what we, what we see with Louis here is just the change in mentality that of I, if I can take it, I can make it to I can't take it anymore. So what does it matter? I can't make it. I can't take this. I can't do this. And that's the, the moment that we hit. And I, I think, I think uh, at least for myself, uh, I, I know I've hit that, I'm sure. A lot of people have hit that every once in a while where you, you have that realization of your own strength, your personal strength is not enough. And that's the moment that Louis has. And, and fortunately for him, uh, we watch him spiral further and further into this depression, this addiction, cutting off the ties with his, his family, his brother, his wife, because he couldn't take it anymore. Like he said, the one thing he was born to do was just ripped away from him. And it's so hard not to, to blame God, to feel alone in those moments that he's working against us. And that's exactly how Louis feels there. Because all of his strength, everything that he's, he's built on himself is not good enough anymore. Um, as we watch, like I said, he spirals further and further into a depression, into his addiction with alcohol, gambling, and uh, it leads to his wife leaving as well. Um, uh, Louis hit his breaking point and so did his wife. Uh, um, but like all movies, there's that little spark of hope that comes back. And it's when his wife comes back to him and says that she doesn't want to leave him. She wants to work through this. But there was one condition. There's one condition for her to, to stay to work through this with him. He needs to go see a preacher. And uh, Louis was really reluctant at first. To, to take this step, because uh, growing up as a kid, he went to uh, a Catholic church, and he absolutely despises it. Um, but eventually, he does agree. He goes a few times, and then has uh, a, a realization with God in uh, the next clip that's going to go up here. Uh, so as we watch this visit that he has, this uh, this moment with the preacher and with God, uh, just take a, take a watch here, and we'll unpack after here. One fact I thought was really cool is uh, the preacher that his wife had him go see was actually Billy Graham uh, when he was doing his uh, his crusades. And uh, I think it's significant. One, it's cool. It's Billy Graham, <laughs> you know. Um, but one, I think it's significant because uh, we hear Louis multiple times in this, uh, this second film, The Path to Redemption, of him despise the church, uh, despise what he grew up uh, grew up in. And I think it's significant. Uh, obviously, God will use whomever to reach whoever he, uh, whoever God needs to reach. Um, but I think it's significant with, uh, with this because the time he offered something so different. So I think it was a way for, for Louis not to just have all of his biases uh, as a wall to, to block it. And I think it's just a really cool, cool moment. Um, <clears throat> but what we see is uh, Louis have, like I said, in the last clip, that realization that his strength is not enough. And then we have in this clip, uh, Louis has uh, a couple things happen. Uh, now, this is not just the movie, but this is Louis telling them that uh, when God spoke to him, it was that moment in the raft that he saw. That was, that was God's message to, to Louis. And there's a couple of things, a couple reasons why. And we're going to break, uh, break down his prayer. It's a really quick prayer. Um, if you save me or if you get me through this, something that he prayed every day. Uh, Louis had the realization before that his strength was not enough uh, to get through every situation. And that realization there is that it was God's strength. God was answering his prayer every day. I mean, you think about everything that he went through from the raft 
the hunger, the sun, the cold, the sharks, the plane shooting at them, the war itself, and then the prison afterwards, for him to still be alive is a miracle in its own. And it was a realization that at no point did God leave him. He prayed every morning for God to get him through each day. If you save me, if you get me to the next day. And that's what God did. The second half of the prayer, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Uh, Louis, uh, he has some really cool interviews that he's done as well. And this is one of the moments he talks about as well. And he said it was a moment of guilt and shame that he felt. And that he had prayed every day for God, get me through this and I will serve you for the rest of my life. And then when he got home, eh, forget it. There's just no, no follow-up to it, right? Something that he prayed every day and committed every day to doing. And then as soon as it wasn't hard anymore, he didn't care anymore. So there was that, that gut check for Louis as well. So he said these, these moments, um, moments, uh, sorry. So like I said, it was a big, a big cut, gut check moment for him that he had said, um, not just that he, uh, he stopped praying to God, but that he wasn't staying true to his word of what, what he would do. So what Louis realizes, one, his strength was not enough, and then two, that God's strength is. Uh, so what Louis does next is he actually works with Billy Graham uh, initially and begins his own, uh, own ministry. So what we watch, uh, I'm sorry, not in these films, but what we, you, can, you can look up and you can listen to his interviews and, and see uh, what, what he decided to do afterwards. And every day he lived for, for God. And one thing that I think is really cool is that he says he knows that this moment was with God. Because like uh, it shows uh, as he's leaving the tent, he sees the prison guard again. Through the film, we watch uh, him have nightmares, uh, very vivid and actually quite scary nightmares in the, in the film itself. Uh, and he says from that day when he dropped on his knees, he has not had one nightmare since then. So he just knows that it was, it was, God, it was really was a moment with God. So he chose to, to follow through and follow uh, what, what he committed to doing when he prayed to God. Uh, so what we see is uh, uh, Louis goes to Tokyo uh, to meet the prison guards uh, that he was under while he was there. He goes there to forgive them and minister and actually brings a lot of them to Christ. And that was his first step of what he wanted to do. Afterwards, he started, because athletics was so important to him, he starts doing uh, a ministry uh, to provide um, opportunities for children who can't afford it or don't have the opportunity to. And they do this camp. And he still does it today. Or he did up until his, uh, he passed away in 2014. So he did it up till then and it's still running now. Uh, but they did this ministry to give children an opportunity to learn sports, but also as a, an opportunity to learn to uh, learn a proper attitude. I'll, I'll phrase it that way, of having um, how to posture yourself before before God and to trust in His strength to to get through every situation, every hardship that that you're going to walk through. So like I said, he committed to doing this and did it up until his death, and it's something that still runs now. Um, but he's very clear to acknowledge that these are not things that he has done under himself, under his strength, but he does it under God's strength. Because he knows now that although as individuals we do have strength, we're, we're, we're made with a will, we have, we have our own strength, but we're going to be pushed beyond what our strength can handle. But we will never be pushed past what God can handle. And that's kind of the message Louis tries to leave through these films and through his, uh, his life as a whole. That not to rely on our own strength, but to rely on the strength that God can provide to give us uh, or to get us through every, every situation that we're going to face. So there's two verses I just want to leave with you guys and then we're going to close in prayer. Uh, the first one is in 2 Corinthians 12.10. For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships, persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And the second one is Ephesians 6.10, right before the, uh, the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his, in his mighty power. And it's a reminder that, like I said, and like Louis has said, you will be pushed past things you can handle under your own strength. So rely on God's strength to pull you through every hardship that you're going to face.
Uh, so let's pray. Uh, dear God, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you that we're able to gather together still, that we're able to talk about you. And you've given us these incredible stories. Uh, there's so much to unpack in Louis's life. And I thank you for the, uh, the examples that you've set before us through these, uh, through these true stories and these films and the lessons that we can learn from them. I pray today that you just bless everyone here. Give them strength to face whatever hardship that they're going through and to remind them that you are there every step of the way. I know a lot of people have probably heard this, but there's that, fo that poem, Footprints, uh, in the sand. And it's a reminder that when you look back on hard times and you see one set of footprints, that it is not God leaving you, but it is him carrying you through that situation. Your name I pray. Amen. Can we, can we just give Pastor Jeremy a hand for this morning? And I, I know that we, uh, we have a baby dedication this morning, but I just don't want to lose the moment here. It's like William Graham, who was playing Billy Graham, ironically, in that film said, you can leave when I'm preaching, but not right now. Just, just not right now. Um. Not everyone knows what you're going through. Maybe not even your spouse. Maybe not your children, your best friend. Some of them do. And, and I, I obviously encourage that we link arms with other people. But I will tell you right here and right now, God always knows. God always knows. And this morning, to acknowledge that, all across this place, acknowledge that God knows. And he does care. Even when things don't seem to be going in the way that you had hoped they would be. God knows. God cares. And as much as God cares about all of your surrounding situations, he cares about you more than anything else. So if I can speak truth and life into you right now, God knows. You can't hide it from him. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would, you would make that known to them that you would make that known to each and every individual. And that strength may come from many sources, but the greatest strength that you can have is God's. And if you're here this morning and you do not know God, you won't understand that statement. But I hope that you would take the opportunity to change that. And so, Lord, I ask right now that you would just dig deep into someone's heart that needs to hear this. Maybe someone listening online that you care, that you know exactly what they're going through. And, God, you care. You care about them, not about the PTSD or the addictions or the bullying or whatever it is that is upon you right now. He knows, he cares, and he loves you. And so, God, would you show them your love this morning, in this moment, just before we get into this dedication. I just, I didn't want this moment to pass without you knowing that. And God, if there's someone here that's like Louie, just in a place where they recognize the next step, it is to surrender to you. I want to give that opportunity right here, right now. So every head bowed, every heart open. If that's you, raise a hand. Just let me know and I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you right here, right now. And if someone online, maybe you can't raise a hand that I can see, but God sees it. So don't lose the opportunity. And so we pray, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for knowing me. Thank you for knowing me, for caring for me, for loving me, and not giving up on me, even when I've given up on myself. God, you be glorified in this moment. And all those that in their hearts are saying yes to Jesus, I say yes right now to, to look away from my sin and look towards the cross that saves. 
and this moment call myself a child of God because it has been declared by the cross that everyone that confesses the name of Jesus and believes in their heart will be saved. And so, God, we just, we thank you for this opportunity to reach out to you and recognize that our own strength is not enough, but yours is. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shaka. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us, you can text us, or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.